Good morning and welcome to the fourth workshop of Social Venture Partners Dallas. Um, today we'll be discussing how to engage corporations for a greater social impact. My name is Prisma Garcia and I'm the Director of Capacity Building for SVP Dallas. Today in our fourth workshop we will discuss how we so corporate corporations can do more within our community and have a positive impact in people's lives. Joining us today, we have several panelists. Um, we have SVP partners, Justin Joost, Lisa Evans-Weaver, Michelle Riddell, Dee Brown, Dana Jewett Residency alum, Brianna Adams, Mary Elise Farah from the Selenese Foundation. And they will discuss how corporate social responsibility can result in positive interactions and results between corporations and communities they interact with. Thank you for joining us. And um, I would like to kick it off with partner introductions. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Riddell. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Something Good Consulting Group. Uh, we actually work with organizations to uh, build their brands with belief-driven stakeholders by aligning their business and social impact strategies. In a prior life, I was a corporate social responsibility executive with one of the largest health insurers uh, in the country, and so have some experience on that side uh, as well. And uh, lastly, but certainly not least, I'm proud to serve as the board chair for Dallas Social Venture Partner. So now I'll turn it over to my good friend, Dustin. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Dustin Jost. I serve as the vice president of sales and marketing for your cause. For those of you who are unfamiliar with your cause, we are a business to business software as a service company that provides an employee engagement platform that connects corporations and their employees to the causes they care about. Uh, we've been around since about 2008, 2009, and I joined the company when we were uh, less than 10 employees working out of a really small square foot office here in Dallas. And over the course of the last uh, eight, nine years, we've grown what we call our global good network to over 500 corporations that represent more than 10 million employees in 180 different countries. And we power employee engagement programs around matching gifts, employee giving campaigns, volunteerism, diversity and inclusion, and grant management. As of last year, we joined the BlackBod family. Some of you might be more familiar with BlackBod, kind of the pioneers in philanthropic technology. So today, I'm really excited to share the perspective that we have across our global good network. Outside of, the, outside of my professional career, I serve on the board with Michelle um, for Social Venture Partners Dallas. I uh, lead our investment committee. And then I've also been a partner with SVP for nearly five years now. And I would be remiss to mention that I am about 48 hours away from having a daughter. So I may be uh, keeping my ear out for my wife in case anything happens, but uh, really excited for some big changes in my life here. And that said, I'll pass it over to Dee. Uh, good morning. Hello, my name is Dee Brown. Um, I've been a strategy and operations consultant at EY for two years. Um, prior to EY, I spent over 20 years in various industries as a supply chain and logistics professional. Uh, in my spare time, I serve our country as a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army Reserve. Definitely glad to be here uh, to discuss corporate social responsibility, but more specifically, you know, my relationship with giving, which has definitely morphed uh, throughout my career. Um, so definitely looking forward to discussing more um, about relationships with nonprofits, uh, specifically around um, not just funding, but how do you really truly engage your corporate partners? Uh, so next, I will pass it on to Lisa. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Weaver. Um, great to be here. I uh, am the co-founder of a consultancy called Unstuck Minds, and we're in a performance improvement consulting group that believes asking better questions is the key to unlocking potential. And I spent the last 10 years focused in the areas of leadership and organizational development, partnering mainly with for-profits, helping them to get unstuck and to develop great leaders and build collaborative work cultures. I'm also the co-founder of the Dallas chapter of Conscious Capitalism. And that's really a growing movement to reframe the dialogue around business and capitalism as a force for good. And you know, we help companies to do that. 
And when it comes to CSR, I think a good business believes that creating value for all their stakeholders is intrinsic to the success of their business and that they consider both communities and the environment as important stakeholders. So this trend is already taking place and I hope to see more companies take this systemic and integrated approach where citizenship and society is built into the core of their business rather than just a bolt-on CSR mindset. And I have been an SVP Dallas partner for 11 years. I uh, can't believe that and am really excited to be here. So I'm going to hand it over to Brianna next. Good morning. My name is Brianna Adams. I work at um, Independent Financial as I'm Assistant Vice President of Community Development Officer. I serve the state of Colorado. Um, I went through the Dana Jewett Residency Program a few years ago, so that's where I was first introduced to SVP Dallas. Um, and previously, I worked at Independent independent financials corporate office in McKinney um, and was a community relations analyst where I helped manage their community grants program. Um, in my current role as a community development officer, I primarily work on engaging our employees across Colorado in skilled volunteer um, opportunities with local nonprofits. Um, and I also work to form, you know, unique partnerships to meet um, local community needs by just spending a lot of time in the community listening um, and then taking that information back to my team and going to the drawing board and seeing um, what we can do to help meet those needs in our community. And now I will pass it back to Prisma. Thank you. Thank you for those introductions and we will go a little deeper in just a little bit. But first I wanted to um, just um, share a couple of reminders. Um, you know, we are on social media. If you'd like to um, follow us, share um, the post being um, shared now or tweeted, um, you could also share your own and add the hashtag SVPD workshop to those posts. Um, I would also like to give a special thanks to Something Good Consulting for helping us make these events possible. Um, you know, we always want to have a, a collaborative uh, mutual learning experience in these workshops. And so with that, I want to pass it on to Mary Elise Farah, who will uh, tell us a little bit more about herself, but also Selenese Corporation and Selenese Foundation. Thanks so much, Prisma. Um, and thanks for having me join this call. I'm really excited to learn from everybody on the call. Um, as you noted, my name is Mary Elise Farah, and I lead the Selenese Foundation. I have the privilege of partnering with our employees all over the world to think through their community engagement strategies. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Selenese Corporation. We're a global chemical and specialty materials company that engineers and manufactures a variety of products essential to everyday living. Our global headquarters is in Dallas, Texas. Um, we, are, we had a $6.3 billion in net sales in 2019. We're part of the Fortune 500. We have approximately 7,700 employees globally, um, 40 manufacturing facilities and operations in 18 countries around the world. Innovation is really at the core of our um, business and we were established in 1917. So we've been around for quite a while. So you can't just go to the store and buy Selenese off the shelf. Um, we make products that go into other products. So we're in inhalers, for example. Um, we're in lots of paints and adhesives like Gorilla Glue. Um, we're in about four pounds of every car on the road and all kinds of different uh, uh, applications within the car. And then something I brought props. We're also, we have a food ingredient business and you can find our products in these products um, in the form of a sweetener that's an alternative to, uh, to sugar-based uh, sweeteners. So we're in a lot of different things uh, and you'd never know that we're hidden in those um, everyday products. We're, we're also a company that really prides ourselves in uh, living through our vision and values. Um, our vision is to improve the world in everyday life through our people, chemistry, and innovation. Um, and one of our, uh, our strongest values is community. And what that means for us is we wanna be able to demonstrate our corporate social responsibility through um, philanthropy, volunteerism, and sustainability efforts. Um, and you know, as a, a corporation that's been around for over a hundred years, we've been able to iterate and Community engagement is nothing new, um, but figuring out how we evolve and advance our investment strategy is really important to us. We really see the opportunity to engage with um, the community as an opportunity to drive success by being able to tap into a common purpose um, amongst our employees. 
So in 2012, we had the opportunity to create the Selenese Foundation. And at that point, we really decided that it was time to make volunteerism and community engagement a part of um, you know, formalized KPIs and to really track this. We, um, since then, since we started tracking sometime in maybe 2014 or 2015, we've logged over 800,000 volunteer hours, uh, which we think is really awesome. Maybe next year we'll hit the a million um, hour mark. We were on about a 200,000 hour per year track record over the last couple of years. Um, and so we think maybe in 2021, we're gonna hit the 1 million hour mark, which we think is awesome. In 2019, 73% of our workforce um, volunteered and logged time in our wonderful platforms supplied by your cause, Blackbaud, our partners over there. Uh, and so we, we think that's really awesome because we're majority manufacturing facilities. And so our employees don't have the opportunity to just pick up and leave their desk. Um, they really are doing this in, in their own personal time and engaging in the communities in really in really meaningful ways on their own time, which we think is really important. Um, so as we continue to evolve and advance this um, community engagement strategy, we really want to make sure that we are thinking creatively about how we engage with um, our individual employees and, and uplift and support them in what they want to do. And then, of course, we're always thinking about how we align with other strategic priorities of the business. So um, we have incredible people leading, leading diversity and inclusion initiatives. We have incredible people leading supplier diversity initiatives. Um, Lisa touched on this a little bit, but you know we're, we're working on our ESG, our Environmental Social and governance practices. We've always been somebody, a, a company that's been really thoughtful about our environmental impact um, and our social impact and how we're thinking about our governance and the people who might be underrepresented leading our company from the corporate board perspective all the way down. And our shareholders are demanding that now. So we're really putting some, some big efforts around how we represent back to our stakeholders what we're doing in those, in those different spaces. And partnership and collaboration to align all those strategies is really critical to our corporate social responsibility strategy. Um, I, I'm so excited about the work that I get to do because my role really is about um, empowering our employees to think about the best way to give back. We have incentive programs, um, for volunteerism, dollars for hours volunteerism programs. We do matching gifts, employee camp giving campaigns, all of that. Um, and we're really excited to continue thinking about what we're doing for our employees. We have a global citizen network, which is essentially an individual from each site that has the opportunity to create the strategy for that site and to think about how we invest our human capital and our financial capital resources in the communities where we operate. We have our impact programming. I'm going to touch on that here in a second with the example that we partnered with, with Social Venture Partners last year. And then increasingly, um, you know, we see a lot of people very interested in the opportunity to do something beyond the one day volunteerism, something larger like a capacity building project or sitting on a board um, or being a, a social venture partners partner or being a part of conscious capitalism. We're seeing our employees really take these um, next level kind of in, in uh, educational opportunities and investment opportunities of their time and energy. And one of the programs that we um, wanted to pilot last year was this Partner and Prosper program um, through Social Venture Partners Dallas. We called it the Selenese Community Impact Program. Um, and this was an evolution of, uh, you know, maybe a decade ago, we started doing these international impact programs, which were really fun, really awesome. We got a bunch of employees, took them out, um, put them out into uh, communities all over the world and sent them, sent them out to do projects. And something that we noticed is that most of those programs were not um, being hosted in countries where we had manufacturing facil facilities or operations or people on the ground in any meaningful way. And so we really started to think, well, how could we do this in our own backyard? We know the need is great everywhere. And as a global company, it might be time for us to think about capacity building in our own communities. Um, and so we started this, this search and we found Social Venture Partners Dallas um, to become the most critical partner in helping us execute this program. We took nine individuals out of their full-time jobs and sent them out in an immersive experience in the community in South Dallas with three partners. Um, we wanted to have the opportunity to, to see these individuals um, grow and evolve their own skills and expertise in this different context. We wanted them to have the opportunity to take perspective and to be challenged and to think about how they can bring that experience back to Selenese in a really um, important and profound way for their teams. Um, 
And of course, uh, our team, you know, Sean and Tony at Social Venture Partners, I mean, among many others I know that supported the effort, really helped us think about how do we, uh, how do we do this work of educating our employees about maybe the difference between, between what they experience in the corporate world and what they might experience um, in the social sector where we partnered? And, and the whole thing was just this really wonderful opportunity for us to try this model more locally. And we have every intention of modeling that in another country and in another region um, uh, sometime soon when we can kind of get back to that mindset um, and in the meantime, of course, all of these smaller opportunities are ongoing um, and shifting over to, to virtual opportunities. So um, it was a really successful program and we see a lot more of that kind of design thinking, collaborative approach going into our teams as they develop their um, community engagement strategies. We're so grateful for the organizations that wind up hosting us. Um, we know it's not easy to manage a bunch of type A corporate folks um, and everyone's been remarkably gracious as we explored these, these programs further. Um, our internal talent is really excited. There's an appetite for this kind of new, um, it's not new, but this, you know, thinking a little bit differently about engaging with communities. Um, they're being challenged and they're, they're being open and vulnerable in ways that might be different for them uh, in their normal day-to-day -day context here, here at work. Um, and we really couldn't do it without a partner like Social Venture Partners um, who can really bring that expertise and uh, thought partnership around cultivating these programs. So I'm excited to be able to share more um, as we continue on through the conversation, but thank you for inviting me to participate in this call. And I think I'm handing it back to you, Prisma. Thank you, Mary Elise, um, for that overview about Selenese Corporation and Selenese Foundation. I know that we don't necessarily always realize how many of your products are within our everyday life, and I am a big fan of Coke Zero, so um, definitely wanted to share that. But um, the way we want to structure today's conversation is... Um, is really hearing, we heard some introductions, we want to hear a little bit more about um, what our partners and, you know, have experienced and how that relates to CSR. Um, and so we're going to go through a round of panelist perspectives, also including Mary Elise in this conversation of, um, you know, how um, corporate social responsibility is important and what has been your experience and you know even perhaps some history about it so i'm going to kick that off with michelle and she's going to pass the torch um, so we're going to go around um, and hear from our partners and um, guest organization all right thank you prisma so uh, what Prisma and Tony have asked uh, me to do today is, um, and hopefully it's not because of my age, but um, uh, really uh, set some, she says no, uh, set some historical context around um, corporate social responsibility. And you know, for everything um, that I'll say, of course, there, you'll think of exceptions. So, uh, you know, just try and keep in mind what I'm, uh, my purpose and what I'm conveying today is really uh, to help those who may not be deep into this work or who may be struggling with, why can't I get, you know, X company to pay attention uh, to what I'm, you know, trying to do. It's in their best interest. It's in our best, you know, the community's best interest. Why are they not paying attention? And um, I, I get this question a lot. Um, so, you know, I just want to share some of this from what I think historically has influenced business. So many, many years ago, really before my time, I promise, but, um, uh, there was often a view of business as having kind of a singular role in our society, and that was to create economic value. And of course, for the most part, you know, they, they did it legally and, and ethically, there are always exceptions, but um, uh, that was really the expectation around business, that they, hold, they held this role in our communities. Um, and that the role of taking care of people in the community, helping our neighbors, if you will, um, uh, it's not that they had no responsibility for it, but the way in which they supported that work was different. It wasn't necessarily writing a check to a nonprofit directly. It was um, often owners of businesses, right, as they accumulated wealth, might support 
uh, nonprofits and this kind of foundation work individually. Um, many businesses, not all, but many businesses, you know, uh, their philosophy was to pay employees um, well uh, so they could take care of their families and presumably help, uh, help their neighbors. You know, back when we knew our neighbors, right? We helped our neighbors and churches also, of course, um, still do, in, in, but just in a different way, uh, but historically played a really important role in just meeting kind of the basic needs um, of society. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it was that that was kind of the history um, of business. And in fact, um, uh, you know, I still sit in meetings and networking opportunities or networking events today where you will run across uh, C-suite leaders and uh, leaders who ser serve on many boards, for-profit boards, who are very, um, uh, have a very strong feeling that the legal obligation of corporations is to the shareholder. And which is why the statement by the Business Roundtable a couple of years ago was, is, is so profound, really. Um, uh, so you, uh, my point here is you have very well-intentioned people. These are not people who don't care about the community. These are not people who wouldn't necessarily support the community generously. It's just that they, they hold this belief that business has a legal obligation to do something else. And that's changing, of course. Um, and, you know, I said earlier, our business really is trying to help businesses respond to these big changes, right? Belief driven, I call them belief driven uh, stakeholders. So um, it's really a generation, um, primarily of young people, not that people my generation don't care, but this generation is really insisting on change. And so they are deciding who they will work for based on uh, the actions of a company and how they're addressing social issues. They're deciding who they will purchase from based on these things. So I think it's important when you're, uh, particularly on the nonprofit side, if you're really, you know, segmenting um, your prospects, if you will, uh, as we would say in a for-profit business, your prospects and your potential donors, that you understand this, um, the differences uh, that can occur uh, from a mindset perspective. Um, and I see that as, although there's a lot of exciting things happening recently, right? The coronavirus will certainly accelerate um, uh, how companies respond uh, to these kinds of things. Um, certainly the uh, murder of George Floyd and, and what's happening with the conversation around race um, will accelerate uh, work in that area. Um, what you're really talking about is culture change in an organization. And so to the extent that uh, corporate social responsibility is still an add-on in companies, um, the, we, will, we will continue to struggle to engage corporations. So, you know, kind of my big takeaway or uh, thing I encourage people to think about when you're, either, whether you're inside an, a corporation, you're thinking, gosh, there's an opportunity to do more, or you're a nonprofit partner is to really ask yourself, um, uh, is, is, how is this work viewed? Is it viewed as um, kind of an afterthought? If so, how do we begin to build the right questions and conversations? I know Lisa's going to lead us through some questions. I'm excited about that. Lead us through, but have those conversations with your corporate partners. Have those conversations inside the companies about, well, wait a minute, what is it that is part of our core operation, our core capabilities? What are we doing every day that has an impact on stakeholders, on the community, on employees? What is it every day? So I, I tell people, you know, if they say, well, gosh, oh, if you're interested in some financial support or, you know, uh, volunteers or whatever, you know, go talk to the community affairs. Uh, no, you got to start having that conversation. What is it that I do every day? What role can I play in either examining what I do, the product I help produce, the service I help deliver? What is it that I can do to help affect change? And that's how I think we'll really um, begin to embed this CSR 
into our organization. So I probably have used up my time, Prisma, and I will turn it over to Dustin. And Dustin, <coughs> excuse me, Dustin's, uh, you heard a lot about his experience and he's gonna share with the audience a little bit more about recent trends. So like in the last five to seven years, uh, some of the exciting things that are happening. But I just want you to keep in mind that still represents a small percentage of companies. Um, maybe a large number of employees, but a small percentage of companies. There's still a number of companies that have a lot of work to do um, to get to where you know we, we need them uh, to play a different role in our in our communities. All right, I'll turn it over to Dustin. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And that was a great starting point to what we're going to talk about, which are some of the more recent trends. Um, Michelle hit the nail on the head. It's about a culture shift, and that's certainly changed over the last 10 years. When we started Your Cause in 2008, 2009, uh, one, we didn't start Your Cause to intentionally go out there and build a technology platform that helps connect corporations and employees. Instead, our founder and CEO was uh, compelled to build a platform to help his own cause. He wanted to help um, folks in Uganda. And what we realized was if we were trying to build this community of do-gooders, corporations inherently have a community built in. And we just need to activate and empower those do-gooders to get out there and connect to the causes that they want to. What we realized was back in that 2008 to 2012 period, really the most progressive companies were the only ones who were investing in not just the CSR program, but the resources to manage it, whether it be teams or foundations or even technology. And in 2012 to 2014, we really saw a pretty big shift. It became not just a conversation amongst the most progressive corporations, but instead, just about every Fortune 500. They realized that the war for talent in the modern workforce was changing the game. The expectations were now that CSR was not just a nice to have, but instead it was something that was required, like Michelle said earlier. But we saw another tipping point in 2016. And it transitioned from the largest corporations, the Fortune 1000s, to just about every company. What we saw that year was about 87% of the companies coming to us to inquire about CSR technology were actually companies were under 5,000 employees. But they were starting to build out these programs. Their executives were engaged. They were starting to get budget and allocating more towards culture shifts as opposed to just transactional programs. Well, in the last few years, we've seen another shift, but nothing quite like like we've seen in the last six weeks of loan. Uh, it's been really interesting to see the number of small to medium sized companies, companies with less than 200 employees saying, it's finally time. We need to get our employees engaged and more so empowered. We don't wanna just put together a program, but instead we wanna give them a set of parameters and guidelines and opportunities to get out there and accomplish what they want to. And I think Michelle also talked about the, the younger generation is looking for more genuine type of programming, not just, hey, we're offering a matching gift program, but instead a way that helps them connect their purpose to the role that they play in society. You know, Zapier earlier this year did a study that showed that millennials don't want to go out and change jobs every two years. You know, we, we always kind of think about that in the back of our heads, but what they found was that millennials actually want to change jobs about every six to eight years. And then Gen Z, they're a little less closer to five to six years. So why are they changing jobs so often? And the recurring theme was that the younger generation just did not feel like their purpose is being fulfilled in the work that they were doing. They view their roles as much more of punch at a clock and getting their work done. But when they were asked if you had programs that allowed you to understand the skills and talents that you use to help move the organization forward and how those skills and talents could be used to actually move society forward and do good in the world, would you feel more fulfilled? Would you feel like your employer now plays a role in fulfilling your purpose? And across the board, the answer was yes. So more and more employee, employees are looking to not just develop their skills, but to grow upon those skills and deploy those out into the real world to figure out how to make a difference. And they're expecting their employer to actually play a role in that. So across the board, people like Mary Elise and Brianna are leading not just programs, but they're leading cultural shifts. And we're even seeing that with the way that the CSR practitioner's role is evolving. It's no longer about just going out there and managing a matching gift program, figuring out what organizations to work with, maybe do a grant making program. But instead, these CSR practitioners are increasingly being looked at as these cross-functional roles that are helping to build altruism and philanthropy 
within individual teams. So more and more uh, disparate workforces or decentralized workforces are leaning on CSR practitioners to come in and do exactly what Mary Elise was talking about within Selene where they have this kind of champion and ambassador program, the Global Citizen Network, that empowers grassroots initiatives, where CSR practitioners are being increasingly looked at to help provide resources, tools, and more so a set of parameters to leaders to build that culture within their own teams. So it's really interesting because I even look at it as, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year, but it's not really an off year. It's more of an awakening. It's an awakening about the role that we all play in work. It's an awakening about system, systemic racism. I mean, there is so much that is shifting. And I think CSR is at the core of that. We've kind of seen it uh, building for the last few years, but I think we're now at another tipping point where CSR is just going to be something that companies need to adopt, not only to attract the right type of talent, but to be competitive, to be competitive with their customers, with their buyers, and then even shareholders. As Mary Lee said, this is becoming an expectation. So ESG is now kind of transforming into something much larger, and it's becoming a set of metrics to really hold yourselves accountable by. If you look at it as the B Corp movement as well, companies that are founded with this this, um, in their charter. So I think it's really exciting. Uh, if I were to give you any advice to kind of take away is that the way that nonprofits engage with corporations is definitely changing. And increasingly, it's becoming more based on just relationships. Whereas in the past, it might have been based on some sort of program, maybe an employee giving campaign, a grant making campaign, a day of service. Instead, we're seeing some of the most successful nonprofits form genuine relationships with people within the company and then work with those people to understand how the company can play a larger role within the organization. Uh, things like the Prosper and Partner Program are a perfect example of that, where there were these relationships with Selenese, and we knew that there was an opportunity to develop the workforce and give them a more experiential opportunity to do good. And that becomes a relationship that now moves the needle, not just for the nonprofits, but also for the employees and for the corporations. So it might seem a bit ambiguous, but as you look at your current constituents, your volunteers and your donors, have those conversations about the role that work plays for them. How do they feel like their purpose is being fulfilled? within the workplace? And is there an opportunity to drive a greater sense of purpose by working together and getting engaged in their CSR strategy? So with that said, I know we'll be talking a lot more through the Prisma, uh, the questions that Prisma has, but I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dee to share her perspective. Thank you, uh, Dustin. You know, when I think about some of the things you're talking about as far as the shift, um, you know, when I look back on my own career, you know, I can think about when those shifts definitely happened. You know, when early in my career, you know, brand new lieutenant um, out of college, you know, my main focus was just what they would call the combined federal campaign, you know, just donating money through payroll deductions, something similar to United Way. You know, and after I left the military, um, most of my giving transferred to United Way you know, depending on what county I was um, working in through my corporate giving as well. When I see the major shift happening is when I joined Selene. So it's very interesting that Mary Elise is on the phone with us today. I was actually, you know, at Selene in 2012. Um, and what was very interesting is, you know, going from what I call a more passive approach, you know, just donating dollars through payroll deduction, to actually supporting organizations like Habitat for Humanity, um, being, you know, here when City Year arrived in Dallas in 2015, and then ultimately, you know, supporting our, um, at Selenese, the annual golf tournament that be benefited the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, um, raising, you know, a million dollars. So, again, you know, seeing those shifts um, that, of course, uh, Dustin spoke of, you know, and understanding that, you know, as I progressed in my career, I needed to take a much more active approach. Um, how do I look at giving? How do I look at the different organizations, you know, that I want to be a part of? And, you know, fortunately, because of um, Selenice's relationship, you know, with Jennifer Sampson and Kit Sawyer at the time at United Way, you know, it was suggested that, 
you know, not only just myself, but other members um, of felonies, um, you know, look at different ways to give, different given societies, again, to get greater exposure to different organizations um, within the city. Uh, so the biggest thing I'll definitely just, you know, I just really want to just um, leave as a takeaway is just understanding, you know, from a nonprofit perspective that uh, your givers within these corporations are going to be going through different phases in their career. And just making sure that that you have the programming available, you know, whether it is, you know, what I call, you know, just the donor or someone who wants to take a much more active approach, um, whether it's being on the board or providing volunteer hours, you know, providing the programming um, in order to support that, which ultimately strengthens the relationship between the nonprofit and the corporate organization. Um, and, you know, when I think now, you know, as far as how I give today, um, you know, now that I'm with EY, you know, which, you know, the thing I tell people is when I started with EY, you know, I just felt like, you know, um, I had a greater sense of responsibility, especially with our relationships that we have with our clients um, and in the community. So I had to look again at how do I give? And, you know, in more recent years, I wanted to do more for the African American community, specifically here in Dallas. So partnered with, you know, the Village Giving uh, Circle, as well as also wanted to do some more um, globally. Um, so working with the American India, American India Foundation. So again, thinking about your donors, corporations, how their employees are giving, what phase they are in their giving, um, and um, again, creating the programming around that. Um, so, um, Next, I will be followed by Rihanna. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dee. Um, so Michelle and Dustin kind of did like a large overview, which I'm so thankful for. Um, and I work in the banking sector. Um, and I think they play, you know, um, financial services institutions play a really unique role in this space, because obviously a lot of them do have um, you know, strategies for corporate social responsibilities. But what you'll find is that those are also um, oftentimes in alignment uh, with, with something called the Community Reinvestment Act. And so I know because there's probably a lot of um, nonprofit staff members attending this webinar, um, Tony had just asked me to speak a little bit to that um, piece of legislation and how it influences um, the decisions banks make when they're pursuing partnerships and allocating grant funding. Um, just kind of a bit of background, the Community Reinvestment Act was passed in Congress in 1977. And it was actually, um, it, was, it was created and passed as a means to address um, redlining that had been occurring across the United States. Uh, sidebar, if you want to read a good book on that, I highly suggest The Color of Law. It's a really good deep dive into how redlining um, has affected um, a lot of individuals' ability to, to build wealth um, in the United States, but that the Community Reinvestment Act was created as a response to that. And so what that law stipulated was that banks um, have a, and an, uh, it requires banks to meet the credit needs of the communities that they take deposits in. Um, and specifically, it stipulates that they need to be meeting the needs of low to moderate income individuals in their community as well. So they can't discriminate with where they're lending or providing mortgages. Um, and, and it also went towards promoting neighborhood revitalization. And so as a nonprofit organization where you might see that legislation um, coming into play as you're developing relationships with different banks. And I think um, Dallas is definitely a huge, a huge city when it comes to the banking sector and financial services sector, um, is, is that um, that piece of legislation calls on banks to also support um, affordable housing, small business development, social services, and neighborhood stabilization in low to moderate income communities. And banks are actually examined on um, not only on their lending and, and how they're fulfilling that, but also in the investments and grants they're making in communities that tie into those uh, priorities, as well as how they're connecting their employees and leveraging their employees' skill set to go out and meet community need. Um, and so as a nonprofit, you're actually, um, there's a whole host of, of corporate talent and local talent at branches that um, oftentimes you're able to tap into because um, employees such as myself who are charged with 
kind of playing matchmaker and listening to community need and then going back and taking that to the company and identifying people who can help meet that. Um, I think I can speak to myself, for myself at least, I'm always looking to see, okay, you know, this nonprofit has mentioned they're, they're looking for financial education services and, and they might not have the staff capacity to provide that in-house. Or um, if there's a board, if there's a nonprofit that's looking for someone to fill a board position and they don't have someone they either don't have an HR, a person with um, HR expertise on their board, or they're looking for someone to serve as treasurer, I can go back and think, oh, I can talk to our HR director, our local HR director, or I can talk to one of our lenders um, and kind of help meet those needs in that way. Um, so I would just point out that there's a, um, to think creatively about volunteer talent and how you can tap into that by developing partnerships um, with local financial services institutions in that way. But then also um, when applying for grants or maybe looking for larger investments um, in your organization, developing an understanding of, of that piece of legislation, the Community Reinvestment Act can often be very um, advantageous since you know um, kind of the lens through which the organization might be um, seeing that application. Um, and that's not to say that banks aren't actively engaged in other um, CSR activities that don't tie in any way um, to CRA, because um, I think most of them have multi-pronged uh, strategies which extend beyond um, that piece of legislation. And then I think another thing that I did just want to speak to as far as um, banks and kind of how they're structured and, and even just speaking to the larger CSR conversation as a whole is, is developing an understanding of who's making decisions um, at different levels of the organization. Because you'll definitely, um, I kind of like to think of it like the government. So there's like the federal government, the state government, the local government. And sometimes it just depends on who you're talking to. So are you talking to the mayor? Are you talking to the governor? Are you talking to the president or legislative body? Kind of the same with banks. So you might have local leadership at the branch, and then you might have um, someone who has more regional decision-making authority. Um, and then some decisions might have to be made by corporate. And so understanding, um, you know, who makes the decisions, um, what's influencing the decisions they're making and kind of what factors they're using um, to make philanthropic, um, those phil philanthropic decisions. And then also um, figuring out how, how that decision making process works. And just having that conversation up front, I, I think is really helpful. Um, and I would hope, I think uh, transparency is, is something that a lot of organizations are, uh, it's a value that a lot of organizations hold or at least are trying, pushing to hold. And, and so I think having that conversation up front um, is, is valuable. Um, and then I, I just wouldn't discount the value of, of asking. Uh, sometimes there's, there's different ways that um, corporations can leverage their, their resources on behalf of, of a local nonprofit. Uh, for a cause, and maybe the answer to your question, your first question might be no, but there might be other questions or opportunities um, that lie beyond that, um, that, the, that um, either the company hasn't thought of or that they are not, they're not aware of a different need that you have that they can say yes to. Um, so really taking time to understand the, the corporation you're speaking with, but then also cor I challenge corporations in the room to really take a deep dive when they're meeting with community partners for the first time and really understanding holistically their programming and what their needs are um, and developing that nuanced uh, understanding to then guide engagement because um, there could be opportunities available for partnership that just aren't immediately apparent. Um, so that's kind of, I hope that provides um, a brief introduction to CRA and kind of how that ties into um, banking and, and how they, they um, pursue community partnerships. Uh, if you, I can send additional resources to Prisma if anyone's interested, but I will um, now pass it back to Mary Elise. Well, that's a 
a uh, bunch of tough acts to follow. Um, so much great information was shared, and I don't know that I'm going to add anything super new and exciting that you haven't already heard, but reinforcing what we've already heard, I think, can be helpful. Um, you know, I'm so appreciative for people like Dee, who came before me at Salonese and really pioneered what um, that culture shift was like. And we, I feel like, are in a place where, you know, for the most part, this idea of giving back to the community is, is baked into the ethos of the company. Um, and now we're at a point where we can really think about how we advance that work. Um, I think a lot about, and a few of you have said, a few of my panelist colleagues have said this, the opportunity to educate and inform our employees so that they can go a little bit deeper, scratch, you know, beyond scratching the surface, but really think about what do you know about our nonprofit partners? Are you um, building sustainable uh, relationships that can go beyond just year over year and even follow you? You know, if you choose to, to go somewhere else, you get another opportunity outside of the organization. We want you to stay connected to that work. Um, it shouldn't be reliant on Salonese as a brand, right? It should be you, your personal passion project. So how do we make sure that we're supporting that work? Um, I, you know, I think a lot about my role, I think Dustin was, was saying this, is so much about connecting the dots and making sure that I am doing my part to be an advocate for our DNI um, and supplier diversity individuals to be able to think about, okay, well, our community partners that are working in this space might be able to get involved um, in some of these initiatives here. How, and how do we educate our team leaders to be um, ambassadors for this work and to have this trickle down approach. Um, you know, I, it's been my experience in the foundation world that some foundations are very well funded with endowments at the end of every year and some foundations are a little bit smaller and we don't always have a lot of financial capital to offer. And we know we also, but we do have a, a remarkable set of expertise and skills and human capital. There's also advocacy work. A lot of corporations have political action committees and have done really remarkable things to ensure that we go beyond just this kind of idea of a monetary investment, but how do you look at leveraging a relationship um, through a corporation and political action to uh, to create systemic change, you know, systemic change, if that's what you're looking for. I just think there's a lot of opportunity for that. And a few of the panelists have mentioned, you know, there's other things like, um, is an office, a corporation moving? Is there some office equipment that you could, you know, unbox yourself from this idea of a one-time grant? How can you get more creative about the ask for the corporation? And then how do, how do we, as individuals who facilitate this work for our corporations get creative to ask the teams, what might you be able to offer if there, a grant through the foundation isn't available right now? We're always trying to think about that. Um, I really hope that, you know, if I can leave a legacy in, in this work that I do, it will be, um, you know, having an opportunity to be a unifying force for our individuals, our teams, our corporation, and, you know, to be able to bring our, um, our community partners alongside us so that we can be together in the community and really moving forward for positive change. Um, the other thing I would say, you know, in this, some of the things that we're thinking about that maybe are going beyond, we love the, the one and done in a day volunteerism. There's something so remarkable about the immediate instant gratification of transformation when you get to do that project. Those projects are invaluable and I think they will always be a really wonderful team building opportunity. Go out and do something together as a team or even with, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, sometimes on the roof shingling uh, with a bunch of folks that I've never talked to before and they, in the next week I'll come into the office and somebody will stick their hand on and say, hey, I've never met you before. I'm like, we were on the roof for eight hours together sweating to death uh, in the Texas sun shingling and just, you know, you don't know out of context. It's so different. It's such a wonderful opportunity to build team and trust and to just get to know each other in a different way. And I think that there's a, a really important positive impact on the way you can drive your business success when you have those kinds of relationships that are forged outside of the, uh, you know, the, the walls of the corporation. So something else that we're thinking a lot about is, um, you know, the, the Partner and Prosper program was really wonderful. And we know there are other opportunities that we can, we've, for years we've done this golf tournament where we've invited suppliers and vendors to come in and make contributions and go on golf. And that's awesome. We're also thinking, how could we invite our, our partners, our suppliers, our vendors, our customers to do something like a design in a day challenge 
where we think about what's a big um, what's a big issue in the community if we just get a little think tank together and um, create an opportunity to learn about a design thinking process in partnership with a nonprofit organization could we create an outcome and this doesn't have to be a four week program or anything more you know, bigger than that. Could we do something where we are collaborating with great minds from an, a partner of ours outside of the normal context in which we do business to do something great for the community? Um, could we do that to support a, um, a tech challenge for students with a high school partner or um, refugees in Europe, you know, who are looking for a, a way to practice English speaking skills? I mean, there's all these great ways where you can, you can think about um, the just taking it to the next level and, in, and encouraging and including folks to come alongside you, especially in when I'm thinking about this from the business perspective, all of these people that we do business with who also have incredible skills and expertise and talent, is there a way to do good together um, in partnership? So those are some of the things that, that we're thinking about. Um, and I think we have a lot of time to answer more questions, but I think those were the highlights that I kind of wanted to share to tack on to the wonderful stuff that was already shared by, by my panelists. Um, and I know Lisa, I'm so excited to hear all the questions that she is going to ask us because I know I'm going to need to take lots of notes and make sure that I'm asking them internally as well. So I think I'm handing it over to Lisa now. Thank you, Mary Elise. And wow, um, really great uh ideas and i love the innovative thinking um to really say how can we think differently around this idea of csr and you know we are in a moment of crisis around social justice racial equity and consequently many leaders of corporations are doing a lot of soul searching in order to understand what the implications are for how they run their businesses and how they've lived their lives i think many of us are you know really deeply thinking about this and while that's important and useful and will result and already has resulted in some good changes, I think the thing to notice is that it's a reaction to a crisis. And so I think the real question, and many of my panelists have alluded to this, is how do organizations keep pace with emerging social issues and trends in order to evolve their identity rather than to preserve their mission and vision in the face of this changing world? So I think successful organizations of the future will learn to evolve with society and they will be purpose built organizations that combine a customer value proposition with an employee value proposition and a societal value proposition. So how do you evolve along with the changing world, keeping all these stakeholder needs and perspectives in mind? And I believe it provides a really important role for nonprofits because it's nonprofits who are connected to these social trends. The nonprofits are the signals in the noise, and they're going to be the leading indicator of the, what the world needs and a corporation's ability to really have this ongoing productive collaboration with a variety of nonprofits who serve a variety of groups that are in need. They'll be ahead of the game instead of finding themselves reacting to a crisis. So I think that's what Mary Elise and Dee and many were talking about. How do we get into these close bonds, relationships, partnerships with nonprofits as corporations, and how do nonprofits see themselves as the resource, not just the ones asking for something? So at Unstuck Minds, we like to think, you know, we think the way to do that is to ask better questions and to use four disciplines as opposed to establishing like this unchangeable strategy or metrics and goals. So I wanted to quickly walk you through these four disciplines that will help you kind of think about and apply these disciplines to expanding your thinking of how to engage with corporations for greater social impact. So this can be good, a good thought framework for for-profits and nonprofits. So the first discipline is zooming out or exploring the context. And we're all very busy people. We're overwhelmed with information. And it's difficult to lift up our heads and notice what's going on in parts of the world that we don't control or that seem disconnected to our daily work until it's not suddenly. So for example, like the rise of Uber, when the taxi business didn't pay attention to social trends and what the needs of users were, and so it's important to practice this discipline of getting off the dance floor, as I like to say, 
and going up to the balcony from time to time to gain perspective and notice what's changing in the world around us. And I think p programs like Partner and Prosper that take leaders and organizations and say, look out, lift your head up, see what's really going on, and then bring that back into our work is super critical. And that is, you know, exploring the context. The second discipline is analyzing the structures. And this is really about zooming in. And right now, that now everybody's talking about systemic racism and impediments to social justice. But we only notice that when there's a problem. The whole reason it's difficult to solve is that until there's a problem or a crisis, these systems and structures are invisible to us. And so they actually constrain our decisions and orient our thinking, and we don't know that that's what's going on. And so when we try to make these superficial changes, they don't work, they don't stick. So whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit, um, you need a way to recognize these assumptions that you operate under so you can have a con conversation about whether the structures in place are serving you or if they're keeping you stuck or are responsible for decisions getting made that you're not intending to make. So an easy example of this is like how you compensate people. So for example, when Domino's um, created this 30 minutes or it's free guarantee, they ended up with a ton of lawsuits because drivers were driving way too fast and unsafely to deliver pizzas before that time ran out. So that was like a structure that they put in place thinking, oh, that's going to be a great marketing tool and everyone's going to get their pizza or it's free. And then they're like, oh, wow, that had a lot of unintended consequences. So the structures that get created by the system take on a life of their own. So you really need to ask questions to get below the surface as an organization and find out what's happening, what metrics or process might be causing inadvertent behaviors that no longer serve you. Um, the third discipline is empathizing with needs. And I think this is kind of the design thinking approach. And Mary Elise was talking about how to do a think tank and a breakthrough session about this. And I love that idea. And this is really the discipline of empathizing with needs and really gathering and appreciating perspectives. So it's about looking at who do you currently serve as a company or a nonprofit and asking what might be changing about their needs? Are we really paying attention to that? And um, looking at who you might not be serving or involving and understanding what their needs and perspectives are. So nonprofits, this is where they could really be a leading indicator in a world that for-profits don't have direct access to. So I love this think tank idea of bringing nonprofits, for profits together to understand those needs really deeply. And that's where breakthrough ideas come from is these perspectives and needs could inform decisions and help to identify new opportunities for new lines of business, products, services. So the question to be asking is how do you build into your system this regular interaction across these boundaries? that wouldn't normally be there for you, but you create that in as part of your system. And the final discipline of an unstuck mind is to challenge assumptions. And this is a big one because this is about developing a comfort with being more explicit about the assumptions behind your thinking before you make any significant changes in strategy or any critical decisions. And a great way to do that is to make sure you're involving people who don't share your same worldview in order for them to notice your assumptions. So if you're only making decisions with people who are part of your world, you guys share the same blind spots. And that's a recipe for you to kind of stay stuck in the cycle and not seeing the opportunities to change or these assumptions you have built into your thinking. So these are the four disciplines that we use to help organizations think differently, to get unstuck and to reorient the way they're approaching things. And I think for corporations, having a relationship with a nonprofit or a couple nonprofits um, is a really useful way to ensure you're using these four disciplines in more consistently in your daily work. So a nonprofit can help you explore the context because they're paying attention to trends and changes you may not be or that are outside of the control of your organization. They can help you zoom in and see some of the structures, systems, and mindsets that are operating in your organization that you may not see but might be keeping you stuck or preventing you from taking advantage of these environmental changes. 
and they can help you empathize with changing needs and challenge assumptions by exposing you to different perspectives and worldviews. So if you think these disciplines make sense and you want to make them a habit, an easy way to do that is change the relationship with organizations who have a different mission than yours. And then one day, who knows, those missions might coalesce. Um, but I think many of us have this going in assumption that for-profits have resources and nonprofits have needs. But I think we can flip the script a little bit and say, I think for-profits have needs and nonprofits have resources. And this is just a different way of looking at that. Um, so just a way to broaden our perspective here. And that's what I wanted to share. But I think Prisma, I'll hand it to you and maybe we can open it up for more questions from the audience. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to all our panelists. I think that we've gathered so much information from different perspectives, um, you know, hearing more about the CRA, hearing more about um, different um, tools and, and just some history on, on CSR. I think, um, you know, we, for, the, for our audience, uh, you know, we do have the Q&A feature open, so you can submit questions there and uh, we'll try to answer them as live in, in just a bit. So please um, start submitting questions now. Um, and I guess to, to kick off, you know, I know that so much was um, offered to our audience today and, and it's a lot to digest, but I, in thinking about, um, I know we had one, just one quick question about, you know, well, what is CR, CSR and then um, what is um, ESG, right? And so I guess I know that Mary Elise, you touched upon this, um, Dustin, you know, and a couple others. Um, so, you know, we know um, uh, corporate social responsibility and then we have environmental, social and, um, and governance. So if one of you could just share quickly, um, you know, maybe what the difference is and how the, those potentially overlap. I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at it. And then um, uh, Dustin, you're the other expert in the room. So <laughs> if I miss anything, we'll send it over to you. Sure. Um, okay, so I think if you're gonna zoom out, like Lisa encouraged us to do, there is really no difference between the two of them, right? Um, what I think is happening with ESG is that, uh, I don't know, maybe this is not a politically correct way to say it, but I, it feels to me like a new metric that's being developed that someone can monetize because there are ratings agencies for publicly traded companies. And, um, you know, there are now all of a sudden we're going to create this new um, uh, set of term, terms. It's a new lexicon. It's not new because we've been doing this forever, but it's now we're going to identify these different buckets and categories in different ways. And we're going to start rating corporations. That's a good thing, right? I don't mean to say that in a very cynical way. It should ha that should be happening. Um, so it's a more formalized approach at uh, unpacking the various ways that specifically right now, I think, publicly traded companies are being held accountable to things like their environmental impact. If they're an, a corporation that, well, most everybody has some kind of environmental impact, right? But um, how, are there, how are we developing clear concrete metrics around those and rolling this into a bigger um, package with ESG? Social impact. Um, it still feels a little bit like the Wild West in terms of the three categories to me because there's all kinds of things that are being measured in there, uh, employee engagement, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and every industri industry has its own um, perspective on what is important as it pertains to each of those categories. So chemical uh, companies are going to be held accountable differently than um, a tech company, for example. So anyway, there's, there's all kinds of different ways to unpack all of that. Um, you know, and then the, the governance, so social is this big bucket in the middle, which has all kinds of things, volunteerism, philanthropy, donations, how, how do you um, do, do good for the community? And then governance is really about the representation and leadership on corporate boards, um, on leadership teams. What, how does that group start to look differently and how is it governed so that corporations are being held accountable to all of these various um, important social needs um, and so anyway, so ESG is just maybe a new packaging of a lot of concepts that are related to CSR or corporate social responsibility. And it's important, I think, for everyone to have that uh, understanding so that you can use them inter interchangeably depending on what 
stage the your corporate um, partner might be at within their own um, it, you know if they're publicly traded and they are being held accountable by their shareholders what do they need to represent back and then how can you help translate so they so that the corporation can understand what it is that you're feeding into it as part of those strategies um, Dustin help me out <laughs> you nailed it <laughs> <laughs> no, that was very well said, Mary Elise. Um, you know, ESG is a framework of measurement. And I think it's really interesting because CSR practitioners have increasingly become data driven. Um, a lot of us might look at them as there's a lot of programs to be managed and you're building cultures. But with all of that comes a framework to measure by. So as you evolve as your, your nonprofit to corporate relationship, you have to understand that the folks you're working with are looking at it both from a qualitative and a quantitative standpoint. We have ESG, we have GRI reporting, we have CECP benchmarking, and each of those looks at programs in different ways, asked for different uh, measurement, and then especially on the grant making side, there's a whole nother level of outcomes and impact measurement there. So one of the things that you can do as a nonprofit is to help make the job of CSR practitioners that much easier by making your metrics clear, by making your impact known and making it clear and helping them understand what role you can play and telling the story that they need to. Because that story might come in the form of communicating to employees about what your organization is doing. It may also come in the form of communicating that up to executives. Many corporations will use their CSR programs as a way to grow their business. Um, you know, Brianna talked a little bit about CRA and the role that CSR plays in the growth of a banking or financial institution, but that also comes into fruition when a, a company is looking to expand locations. Uh, they may be working with local government officials and those government officials want to understand what have they done to drive the community to get a sense of how they can drive the community going forward. So there's a lot of this quantitative data that comes into it. And again, it comes out in different vehicles. It might be at ESG. It may be another sort of reporting framework. But just work with the corporations to, to make it clear on what kind of quantitative metrics they can leverage as they go and tell these stories and quantify impact. Anyone else? Um, thank you, Mary, Elise, and Dustin for those um, that explanation, you know, when I, and we're receiving, I know that we are receiving some questions from the audience. And so it's, um, we'll be asking those, but in terms of giving that as a nonprofit leader myself and having worked in a community-based organization, sometimes it's like, um, we want to make sure that, you know, a corporation, if they walk through our door, you know, we're, we, we make them feel great and we um, engage their volunteers, even if we don't even have maybe the opportunities at the time, um, you know, and, and we trying to, you know, continue to build those authentic relationships. But then when you look at, you know, giving, um, you know, it's corporations and corporate giving is a, is a small, only a small piece of the pie, right? Um, it's, you know, five, maybe 5%, five it's grown um, to maybe 5.5 four or 5.5, um, Dustin, you might know better numbers than me here, but, um, you know, and you think about that, yes, it is a large quantity of, you know, billions of dollars, but when you think about our giving in, in America, $424, $25 billion, then um, it's really just a small part. And so, you know, when we see the pie and look at it, you know, in terms of individuals, then we think, um, well, maybe I'll, I'll do more efforts in terms of cultivating my individuals. Um, so how do we get more corporations to start making efforts within, you know, their, you know, giving programs? Um, you know, I've heard corporations or even small businesses say, you know, we're too young, we're too um, small to, to start those conversations. Um, so what do we share with those groups? Yeah, I think all. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me, um, let me share an example with the... Um, with uh, the audience and just because I, I think, you know, we've had a great discussion here with the panelists and we've really got to start thinking beyond, you're right, the, the pool of dollars to actually write a check with that's under this um, description of uh, community giving in somebody's budget, there will always be a limit to that. There will never be enough, I promise you that. So I think what we're trying to do is really ask nonprofits to become partners with business 
in looking at how the business itself can have uh, play a role in addressing social issues. So some call it social enterprise, you know, it, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the good news is, with it being the wild, wild west is we can be creative and innovative. That's the part I love. But I'll use this example, and it's um, in, a, in a book that I can um, send the link to afterwards if you want to send out Prisma. It's used as an example. But if you'll remember, probably 10 years or so ago, uh, Walmart came out with low-priced prescription drugs. I mean, generic drugs, 3 to $4.00. And um, which were, you know, high use drugs, important part of uh, chronic disease management. Um, so really just invaluable to so many people who had barriers, cost barriers to accessing the medicines that they need. They came out with this generic. Now, did they do that because it's the right thing to do and it helped um, uh, uninsured or underinsured? Perhaps. Um, we hope so, right? Uh, guess the other reason they did it. What, what else would it do? It would drive traffic through their stores. It would bring traffic to Walmart, right? And so that's, I think that's the kind of innovative next level thinking that um, we want to help both business and nonprofits think about is um, how do you have the conversation with a business about, hey, what's what's on the horizon for your business over the next 12 months? What are the challenges you're facing as a business? Um, uh, are you having trouble with talent, you know, acquiring talent? What are the specific issues? And then really as a nonprofit partner going, what is it in my wheelhouse? What, what is it that I can do to help this company evolve and, and, and have some shared interest in maybe solving some of the problems they have? but it's a shared interest. It's a shared opportunity. Um, and I think that's where uh, really kind of leading edge, I mean, some B Corps, we mentioned those early on, social uh, enterprises. I mean, their whole uh, framework and, and reason for existing is to, is to merge those two ideas. But I think the real opportunity and what's gonna really unlock resources and cultures and everything is to think about where, where do we solve these problems collectively? Um, how do we solve them at, you know, uh, in partnerships uh, like that? So I just wanted to share that as an example of, and I love the questions that Lisa mentioned because that's the kind of asking those questions in the organization are we gonna get us out of this traditional um, dance is what I call it. It's the traditional dance. I had uh, millions of dollars in my budget um, when I was managing corporate social responsibility. And I will tell you, people used to say, oh gosh, you have the best job in the world. I said, do you understand that I say no many, many more times than I say yes? And that's because the need was always outpacing uh, the supply, that it's just the way it is. Um, so I think we have to get much more creative about the partnerships between companies and nonprofits. I'll leave it at that. Michelle, I think to your point where we've seen this a lot recently is businesses, even local businesses where you might not think there's not necessarily a CSR, you know, there's no one that wears just that hat. But in the wake of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think you've seen a lot of local businesses really lean in like distilleries suddenly producing hand sanitizer or um, local design fashion companies producing masks. And I think uh, locally in North Texas, the Get Shift Done initiative in partnership with Communities Foundation of Texas and um, several local business leaders and then lots of local restaurants is, is an example of how, to your point, you don't have to have um, a CSR budget to really leverage your core competencies as a company and partner. That was such a beautiful partnership across the, the philanthropic community, the business community, and then uh, the food bank, the nonprofit community. Um, and I'm hoping a lot of the disruption that's happening right now will continue to drive that innovation in the CSR space to meet, to meet communities in better ways. Thank you. Um, our questions from our audience are, are definitely coming in strong. And so I'm going to make sure we get to as many of these as possible. Um, and some of them I know will overlap. So if your question doesn't get answered, um, 
you know, we can be in touch after this session. So I, I know here I have a question for Lisa. Um, Lisa, um, we have a person in the audience asking us, um, how can a nonprofit take a wider scope to learn from the context, um, you know, even during this um, pandemic, um, you know, an ongoing human rights um, crisis, um, you know, obviously the the racial injustices aren't, aren't necessarily new, but we've seen a lot of that happening now. Um, uh, many, many nonprofits are, you know, in reactive mode um, in terms of fundraising. I guess, how mm -hmm. can, you know, a nonprofit and, and I guess also corporations really continue that in the future and, and maybe not just focus on now, um, but obviously yeah. continue that. Yeah, great question, and I'd love to hear other panelists' thoughts on this, too. Um, I think, you know, building in time for a, a team of people, oftentimes it's the senior leadership team or at nonprofits, kind of the, the senior level leaders leading the organization, bringing a diverse group of people together to go through a strategic thinking, strategic planning process. You kind of have to remove yourself from the daily noise and the, you know, we got to get these things done and check things off the list and create a space to have that strategic conversation. And so we often run and will facilitate and kind of design sessions like that for organizations, leadership teams, nonprofits to say, how can we step out of the day to day and really think strategically? And there's often, you know, pre work to say, talk to different stakeholders that are not normally ones you would talk to in your community with companies, different things to gather some input and some, you know, ideas. Um, and then we come together and we have that session around strategically thinking about things, stepping back and saying, where do we need to make changes? What's changing in the world that we should be paying attention to? And then connecting it back to strategy. So that's one way. I think, you know, I, I personally have people that I talk to that pay more attention to the trends and the news, and they are these information digesters that can take in all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even see that today, you know? And so I feel like just having your your circle of people that can give you those perspectives in, and what trends they're paying attention to and a variety of different people that you talk to on a regular basis, have coffee with, have a Zoom with, just to say, what are you paying attention to? What's getting your attention these days? And it will open your eyes to things you may not otherwise be paying attention to. So those are a couple ideas, but I'd love to hear what others think. Um, if, if we don't have any other comments from any others, um, I'd like to move on with a question for Dee. Dee mm -hmm. is a new social venture partner, but I know that um, we've had um, leaders from Ernst & Young um, a part, you know, be a part of social venture partners for some time now. And so question from the audience asking how is uh, EY responding to the human element of COVID-19 um, and, you know, increasing information and awareness, you know, police brutality comes to mind and just um, centuries of inequities um, in our country. And so, Dee, if you want to give us some insight on that question. You know, I really, um, if um, the audience member doesn't mind really focusing more, um, you know, on the police brutality and the racial uh, inequities, I'd rather focus on that because it's quite a bit if we talk about COVID as well as the racial inequities. Um, so the thing I will say is, is that, you know, over the last um, month, when I say EY has been first to move, um, it, it's really an understatement. Um, you know, when you even think about Prisma, um, you know, how myself and Kevin Muscat reached out to Tony almost immediately, like, what can we do? Okay, how do we get to the city leaders, you know, understanding the power of EY um, and our relationships with our clients. Um, you know, how can we get in front of city leadership so we can get the dialogue going and we can understand, you know, what is it, you know, whether it's, um, 
you know, legislation, whether it's um, additional support, which EY has um, yesterday, um, Michelle Bobney, our managing office partner, um, as well as Kevin Muscat, met with the DA individually with his team. Um, just again, trying to figure out what is it that we can do to really move forward? Um, what are those steps that can be taken? Not just, you know, the hashtags, okay? And, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I understand the purpose of them, but ultimately people want to see action, people want to see prison reform, people want to see a better relationship between law enforcement and the citizens. Um, and, you know, the thing I will definitely say is EY is definitely at the forefront of that. Um, in addition to that, EY um, globally um, has dedicated um, millions of dollars to HBCUs, as well as a further commitment to our employees for those organizations that they wanna support, that support racial injustice. So when I say they are putting, I mean, there was no hesitation from the beginning that they are anti-racism, not just not racist, but anti-racism and really putting their money and their efforts and leadership, not just locally, but also nationally and really are willing to take those steps to go to DC as well for any legislation that needs to be put into act um, and supporting um, legislation that will definitely reduce racism. Thank you. Thank you, D. Um, you know, we'd love to have EY as a partner in, in our response series and um, also sharing, sharing this um, vision with us at SVP. So I know that we have so many other questions and I know we're getting close to time, but we're going to try to get to as many of them as can. And so I know um, there have been a couple questions about ERA and how it is often applied to housing development and um, obviously in the within the banking industry. And so, um, Brianna, if you could give us a couple more examples of how CRA initiatives are are being supportive through Independent Bank, but also, you know, others that maybe you've seen. Um, we have this as a question from the audience. Sure. Um, so the just to clarify, the, the question was kind of providing a few examples of what we've done, activities that we've done that have kind of align with that CRA legislation, yes. but also in the community. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, so I think one resource that we've started, love, at least um, taking advantage of uh, in, in Colorado, and we're looking to expand this, is um, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas is um, an organization that banks, if they're members of, can apply um, for grant funds to benefit low to moderate income homeowners to assist with um, down payment, uh, to provide down payment assistance. They can, al it can also um, provide funds to help veterans do uh, repairs or re rehabilitation on their houses. Um, and so that's just kind of a, a tool and a lot of banks tool belts where there's money on the table um, through the Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas. Um, and it just takes um, someone from the organization applying for that funding on the behalf on behalf of a nonprofit um, or a local a local family. And so that's something that we've been we've been leveraging. Um, I, I've been leveraging in Colorado and we're looking to kind of um, do a deep dive in across um, each of our markets in the future. Um, I think that this year, especially in, the, in, in kind of the past year as well, especially before the pandemic kind of uh, disrupted volunteer activities, we've really been focusing on um, how do we connect employees, first of all, how do we take an internal inventory and think about, okay, what are our employees really good at and how does that translate externally to, to um, the work of nonprofits in our community? And so I've been um, just meeting with a lot of teams, understanding what our employees do, what they're passionate about, what causes they're passionate about, and then going and um, just doing investigative work in the community and trying to, to do matchmaking, like I said, and keep an eye out for um, board opportunities, um, crafting financial education materials. We just did some virtual, um, we kind of created an online video library for one of our partners of some workshops so that they could just provide um, to, to the folks that they work with on basic financial literacy concepts. Um, and then I think our, our grant program is kind of a, a primary way that we 
deploy funding into the communities we serve. And that's where you kind of get that CRA, CSR, messy overlap, right? So those, our funding priorities um, are mostly aligned with CRA, but there's a lot of, um, not a lot, but there's, there's, there are um, activities that we fund that are in the healthcare um, space, for instance, through that program. Um, that might not seem directly related to that affordable housing piece, um, but are providing it provides community services to low to moderate income individuals, which does kind of like tie back into the CRA um, bucket. But I think I would, um, I think what I would encourage, I, I think the the regulation is kind of a, a beast and just like really not fun to read. Um, so I encourage people to go out and do their research. But I think if you um, meet with just like a local, your local community development officer and just set aside time um, to ask them about it and ask what's your, what's your strategy locally, what types of opportunities are you trying to, um, to partner on and what are you interested in. Um, I love, I love those conversations because a lot of times I come away learning so much more about the community um, and I don't know, you know, you don't know until you know um, and, and like, um, I think Lisa was saying, and perhaps Mary Elise as well, just surrounding yourself with other voices um, is, is really important um, for CSR professionals because um, if we don't have those interactions with the community, we can start going on a path that is not, we're operating on assumptions that might not be the reality. And community-based organizations, um, especially ones that are grassroots, you know, grassroots led are so, that knowledge that they have is so valuable so that our strategy does take into account local need and is not, um, you know, we're not just flying up over here basing our activities off of assumptions that might not be reality. Thank you, Brianna. I'm looking at the time and I know it's time to close out, but I guess in terms of just some final words. I know I have a couple of questions still left, but um, you know, some, some final words from our panelists in particular related to how do we push? Um, I know that corporations, what we've heard, there are some, um, a lot of them are trying to adjust their messaging and, and really shift during this time as we all are, right? But, um, but how do we, how do we ensure that corporate leaders continue to support their employees in our communities? And, and we'll close with that question. So if um, our panelists want to take a stab at that. I, I will just close with, I like the way Lisa put it in that um, uh, it, I think it from a mindset shift, it's helpful to kind of flip the script sometimes and for nonprofits to look at themselves as the resources and companies have needs, have the needs. And it's just about a different issue. You know, you, you really have the expertise, you're in touch with the communities, you, you have your finger on the pulse. And so you really have an opportunity, uh, particularly now while people are listening in a, maybe a new way, to help guide and educate and raise awareness. And it's, and Justin, or Dustin said, sorry, Dustin, I tried to make you a one word. Um, <laughs> um, but um, Dustin said, um, you know, how important it is to really look at these relationships as not transactional, not I'm gonna submit a request and cross my fingers and pray and hope I get a funding request, but instead, how do I build a long-term relationship? And you, you really can just view yourselves differently. View yourselves as the resource to help companies evolve in this space. And I'll just add, I think, Michelle, I agree with everything you're saying. And, you know, corporations can do similar things like what Selenice and Mary Elise did with SVP around Partner and Prosper and really leverage, you know, employees want to do purposeful work and you want it embedded into the work you're doing as an organization. And there is an opportunity for people to practice skills as leaders, right? I want to get better at marketing. I want to get better at technology, but maybe I can practice and learn with a nonprofit in partnership and do some of that work that a nonprofit has a need for as I develop my skills and my leadership. So 
again, thinking creatively about these partnerships and knowing both parties can bring different things to the table and just expanding that viewpoint and really just have the conversation, bring a few companies together, a few nonprofits together and do, I'm happy to facilitate a breakthrough session on what could we do to solve these social issues that we all care about and see what emerges from that. Um, thank you, panelists. Um, I know that we, I did not all of us got to share some final words, but um, we are at almost to our time. So I just wanted to um, thank all of you. Um, but also, I know that we have some people in the audience who are asking, how can, you know, we get started? How, you know, what about if the traditional volunteerism isn't for our corporation? And so I know we've heard a lot about Partner and Prosper, which is our program at SVP Dallas, and um, not all of you may know what it is. And it's a skills, skill based volunteer program um, that we've launched to unite local companies and nonprofits and social enterprises. And so we really focus on fostering those relationships and managing those projects. And Selenese um, was one of the corporations that participated in that program. And so if you're interested in learning more about our Partner and Prosper program, please reach out to us. Um, you could go to our website, svpdallas.org. Also, as an individual, we hear, um, you know, individuals are looking to plug in different ways, not necessarily always through their corporation. And so um, there are opportunities for um, individuals to become partners and to increase the capacity of our nonprofits and social enterprises here in Dallas, especially during this, um, this tough time. As a reminder, um, on um, last week, we had um, we held our first discussion um, regarding um, the criminal justice system, uh, you know, here in the U.S. in terms of you know the, the justice response, um, you know, that particular series. And so we're going to continue the conversation um, on June 30th. We'll have um, some panelists joining us um, for justice response. This is a part two in the response series, we'll have James Foreman, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning author of Locking Up Our Own. Um, you know, I have my book right here. Um, Lynn Richardson, who you may have heard, um, she's at Dallas County Public Defender's Office and um, Jonathan Rapping, which is, um, you know, founder and president of Gideon's Promise. And this, um, you know, series will be, will continue to be narrated and uh, moderated by our very own CEO, Tony Fleo. And so we hope to see you next week um, as we continue these tough conversations. And if you would like to engage within our community, please reach out to SVP Dallas. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, we hope to see you again next week.